as it is our last service of the year and as we're heading into the Christmas story, um, we're going to keep it pretty simple tonight. Uh, I'm going to read for you the first part of the Christmas story. Uh, I want to read for you really the the first part of the Gospel of Matthew, the first um, 16 verses of the Gospel of Matthew, and I just want you to hear how the Christmas story starts. And here's going to be my guess. My guess is you've heard a lot of the Christmas story, uh, but then tonight I just want to kind of unpack a part that usually gets skipped over a little bit um, and see if that might uh, encourage and challenge your heart tonight as we head into Christmas a week from tomorrow. And so uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. If you have your Bible, uh, you can pull it up on your phone. We'll have it up on the screen. As always, we try to tell you, if you don't own a Bible, our gift to you is a Bible on your way out there on that back shelf. would love for you to have a copy of the Bible. And so here's how Matthew chapter 1 begins. It says this in Matthew 1.1, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. Verse 2 says, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadad, Abinadad the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz whose mother was Roab. Bo, uh, Rahab, sorry. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of uh, Aji, uh, or Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Je- 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 Jeroam. <laughs> Jeroam, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Asa. Asa, the fire- father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Je- Jeconiah. <laughs> and his fathers at the same time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of... Sh- I'm not even going there. Uh, she, uh, yeah, so it was the father of Zerubbabel. Shh. 13, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Uh, Abihud, the father of Elekium. Elekium, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Eliuhud. Eliuhud, the... I'm not even close. Uh, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathen, Mathen, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Okay. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, my rap album is coming soon with all of his names. Um, now I'm going to guess something. I'm going to guess that if we were to take a poll of this room and ask, what are your favorite Bible verses? I'm going to guess the 16 verses we just read are not going to make the list for any of you, right? Like, here's my further guess. If you're anything like me, what tends to happen is if you've read the Bible and you open up to Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament, and you go, I'm going to read the book of Matthew. You see this list of names and you go, okay, genealogy of Jesus, Messiah, son of David, skip to verse 17 and keep going, right? That's what we tend to do. When we see this long list of names in the Bible, which this isn't the only place, there are many other places you see these long lists of names, what we tend to do is skip over it. What we tend to do is go, those are a lot of very confusing names that I can't pronounce and don't know anything about, and so we skip over it and move on to other things. Now, that's understandable. And that's not the worst thing in the world. It's not that you're an awful person if you do that, because the truth is I've done that. But tonight, here's what I want to do. Tonight, I want to pause and think about this list of names. I want to pause and think about this group of people, this this group of 42 people we just read. I want to pause and talk about the genealogy of Jesus, because when we talk about the genealogy of Jesus, what we're really talking about is Jesus' family. And maybe you've never thought of it that way. But when you think of your genealogy, what you're really thinking about is your family. You're thinking about the people that you share a bloodline with. Everyone in this room, whether you know them or not, you have a a father and a grandfather and a great-grandfather and a great-great-grandfather and a great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather who goes all the way back. All of us have a genealogy, and that genealogy makes up our family. It makes up our family tree. And tonight what I want to do is spend a few minutes just thinking about the family tree of Jesus. 
I want to spend a few minutes thinking about Jesus' family tree and what it's like. What type of people are in Jesus' family? Because I think tonight as we look at what type of people are in Jesus' family, we might just be encouraged to realize that Jesus' family is much more diverse, much more broken, much more all over the place than we had ever imagined. And that is good news for everyone in this room. And it's good news for everyone in this room because you might think the family of Jesus is filled with these perfect people who never got anything wrong. And what I hope to show you tonight is that Jesus' family is all over the map. It was in this genealogy and it continues to be Jesus' family in this room. And so rather than going through all 42 of these names, I've just selected 10. 10 names that are in this, and so if you're taking notes and just want to write down these 10 names, you can. Uh, if you've got your Bible and just want to kind of circle, underline, maybe highlight, maybe put a star next to it, say, I want to read this story at some point. I want to walk you through these 10 people and give you just a little insight into who they were. The very first person on the list is Abraham. Abraham. Um, Abraham is um, a massive character in the Bible. In fact, outside of Jesus, you could argue that Abraham is the most significant central person in the entire Bible. The entire story of the people of God in the Bible actually begins with Abraham. Things like Adam and Eve and Noah all kind of set us up to this moment when the Lord God of heaven encounters Abraham and has a conversation with him. He calls him to trust him. And just there's so many things we could talk about when it comes to Abraham, but here's the thing I want to point out to you tonight. You'll see it up there. That Abraham was the first in his family to trust the Lord. Just think about that for a second. Abraham's parents didn't trust the Lord. Abraham's great-grandparents didn't trust the Lord. Abraham was just moving about life, and Abraham got met by God because God chose to meet him. God reached out to Abraham before Abraham reached out to God. And what I want to point out is that he's this first person in the family to trust the Lord, and I just wonder if that would encourage anyone in this room who feels like you're the same thing. You're the first person in your family to trust the Lord. Uh, like some of you grew up in homes where your parents aren't Christians at all. They don't love Jesus. They don't go to church. They don't want anything to do with all of this. And for whatever reason, somehow God got a hold of your heart and you're here and you love Jesus and you're the first person in your family tree to trust the Lord. Or maybe you're the type of person where your parents call themselves Christians and they kind of go to church, but you're kind of the first person in the family who actually started, you know, taking this seriously, believing this stuff. You're the first person who actually shows up to church regularly or really reads your Bible or actually cares what God has to say about your life. Here's the crazy thing. God has room in his family for people like Abraham, people whose parents, people whose grandparents didn't love the Lord, but they do. And God still has room in his family for people just like that. I want to tell you tonight and just celebrate with you. If you're someone in this room and your parents don't love the Lord, you're the first person in your family to walk with Jesus, go to church, get baptized, any of these things. I want to tell you that the family of God is for you. It just in the same way that Abraham got to experience being part of the family of God, we celebrate that there are people in our church and people in this room who are part of God's family. And they're the first person in their family to trust the Lord. The, the next one I'm going to point out is a guy named Jacob. The next one is a guy named Jacob, and Jacob is this fascinating character in the Bible where, where Jacob actually has this amazing experience with God, um, where Jacob wrestles with God. It's an amazing story in the book of Genesis if you want to read it at some point. There's actually this story where God wrestles with a man. And Jacob and God, they wrestle all night. And what's really clear is that God's not like wrestling all night with Jacob because he can't beat him. It's like really clear that God's just letting Jacob wrestle with him. In fact, it's so clear that at the end of the fight, here's how it ends. It ends with God reaching out his finger and touching Jacob's hip. And it just pops out of its socket. And he goes, I'm out. Right? That's how the wrestling match ends. But God allows Jacob to wrestle with him. God allows Jacob to ask questions and wrestle with him and be uncomfortable. In fact, I, I said it this way, Jacob wrestled with God and struggled with doubt. Like, I want you to think about that for a second. The second person on Jesus' family tree is someone who was filled with doubt and struggle, who wrestled with God and wrestled with his promises and wrestled with his commandments. I, I think sometimes what happens is some of us come into the belief that everyone in this room is 100% sure of everything when it comes to God. 
And so if you start to feel doubt or unsure, maybe you're unsure even God even exists, or maybe you're unsure if you really want to trust the Bible and believe what it has to say, I think sometimes people in this room feel like, well, everyone else believes it, and so am I really welcome here? Am I really part of this thing? And here's what I want to say to you tonight. There is room in Jesus' family for people who wrestle with God and struggle with doubt. If that's you, and you're just going, listen, I'm just doubting God's existence. I'm doubting whether or not he loves me. I'm doubting whether or not he's actually going to take care of me. I'm doubting whether or not actually trusting and believing and obeying the commands of the Bible is really going to help my life. If you are filled with doubt and you're wrestling with God, I want to tell you there is room in the family of God for you. The next one we're going to look at is a, a woman named Rahab. Rahab is um, Rahab's a really interesting um, person in the Bible where Rahab is actually, the action she does in the story is actually a beautiful thing. She saves the people of Israel. She, she helps some spies hide out. She does this whole thing where she actually does a really good thing. But the thing that Rahab's really known for, and this is actually part of the tricky part of her story, like she does a good thing, but what she's known for is the fact that she's a prostitute. So I want you to imagine this for a second. Here's someone who actually did a good thing and blessed the people of God, but she's known for her sexual sin. She's known for her sexual sin. She's known as a prostitute, but she's trying to do the right thing for God and for his people. And and here's what's just not lost on any of us. Man, Man, this room is filled with people who have sinned sexually. Just filled with it. If you've somehow come under the impression that you're the only one who struggles with sexual sin, the only one who struggles with lust, the only one who struggles with porn, the only one who struggles with with sexual sin or something you did in your past that you wish you hadn't, uh, I can just really easily tell you that this room is filled with people who live with the deep regret and the shame and the guilt of sexual sin. And here's the good news of the gospel, that there is room in the family of God for you. And there's room, not because we don't think sexual sin is a big deal, not because we're like, ah, do whatever you want, have fun. No, we're going to call you to repent of it. We're going to call you to walk in purity. And at the same time, here's Jesus' family. And one of the people that's named in Jesus' family, in Jesus' genealogy, is someone whose entire life and career was devoted to sexual sin. And yet she is part of the lineage of Jesus, part of the people of God, part of God's family. And that's just a good news invitation. If you're just living in regret because a couple years ago you and, you and some guy did something and crossed the line you said you'd never do. Ladies, like, hear me on this. You're living in this shame. You're living in this guilt. And God says you're still welcome in my family. Uh, like, guys, for so many of you, there's just this ongoing struggle with lust, this ongoing struggle with pornography, this ongoing struggle in your life, and you feel so ashamed and so guilty. Like, what would God want anything to do with me? And the amazing thing about our God is he says you're welcome in my family. There's room for people like you. There's room for you in the family of God. The next person we'll look at is Ruth. Um, Ruth is, um, Ruth is, if you've never had the opportunity to read about Ruth in the Bible, to read the book of Ruth, um, at some point go do that. A a remarkable woman, a hero of the Bible, incredible woman. But but here's the interesting thing about Ruth. Um, I want to point this out. She was a different race than the culture around her. So so let me explain. Um, Ruth operated, most of her story operates within the people of God in Israel, but she actually came from a different culture. She came from a different place. Like she had a different racial background, a different cultural background, a different national identity than everyone else. And so what was so fascinating about the story is she's operating in the midst of all of it, and and yet it's really clear that she comes from a different place. She feels different. And, And here's what I know is true in this room. Um, Some of you grew up in this area, or or some of you just kind of fit into the culture of this area, and so you've always kind of felt like you belong here. But I know that there are some people who feel like you're different than not not just this church, but everyone else in this community, everyone else in our city, in our area. I mean, I know that some of you are actually born in a different country. And you moved here at some point during your life, and you're trying to navigate what it means to live in Southern California, in American, in, in 2017. You're trying to figure all of that out. I mean, some of you come from a, from, from a household or from a culture that just doesn't fit the culture around here. Uh, many of you come in as ethnic minorities, and you're trying to figure out how to navigate the complexities that come from being a people of color in a community of Westlake Village and Thousand Oaks that's largely Caucasian. And here's what I want to say. Right here in the genealogy of the people of God, you see someone who's from a different race come in, which reminds me 
that racism has no place in the people of God. In fact, the family of God should be a place where we say everybody's welcome. Doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter where you came from, doesn't matter what language you speak, what tribe you're from, what country you were born in, doesn't matter any of that. Here in the family of God, there's room for you. That the family of God is not for one particular race or culture or identity. The family of God is for anyone who would claim the name of Jesus, who would call upon his name. The next person we're going to look at here is King David. Um, King David is interesting. All the other people, there's other kings named in here, but they're all just named for their name. King David is actually given the, the title king. And if you don't know King David's story, this is another massive, overwhelmingly outsized presence in the Bible of this King David. And King David is one of those guys who's so frustrating. Here's what I mean. You ever met one of those people, it seems like everything they do, they're awesome at? It's like they're smart, and they're athletic, and they're good-looking, and well-dressed, and they're wealthy. They've got everything going for them, and you're just kind of like, I don't think I like you. Like, that's David, right? We've all met these people, and if you're like, I don't think I've met a person like that, you might be that person. And we've all met those people. And here's, here's the actual truth of that. Um, when you talk to people who are just kind of successful at everything and everything seems to fall into their lap, um, sometimes you can think that they just kind of have it all going and they're oblivious. But here's what usually happens. Um, people like that are actually painfully aware that they just tend to win at everything, be good at everything, that they tend to have all sorts of blessings upon them, and it can actually feel very lonely. And, and so hear me on this. I, I don't want you to miss this. Christianity is not just for the down and out. Christian faith is not just for people who are hurting or people who have been rejected. Christian faith is not just for people who have nothing. It's for the down and out, but it's also for the up and in. So, so let me just say this. If you're the person who just kind of everything seems to work out for you, you're good at things, you're smart, you're, you're the captain of the team, you're the lead in the play, um, everything just seems to kind of work out for you in your life, um, I want you to know that Christian faith is actually for you, and there's room in the people of God for you. There's room for you and the people of God, even if you're like King David, who's ridiculously successful and gifted and talented and at the same time deeply wicked. Like if you don't know the story of King David, King David um, has an affair with another woman and then in order to try to cover up the affair has the, guy, the woman's husband murdered. Um, so that's kind of how King David does things. So maybe you're that kind of popular person and everything seems to work out, but you kind of hurt people along the way. And I just want you to know that just like King David, um, there's a place for you in the family of God. There's a place for you. Um, maybe some of you need to hear that who actually kind of look at popular people at your school and kind of despise them. I think some of you look at popular people, good-looking people, talented people, smart people, and you despise them, and you kind of don't like the fact that they might come to church someday or that they might get saved or get baptized. And I want to remind you that Christianity is for the down and out, but it's also for the up and in. It's for the people who are doing well. It's, uh, it's for the people who are doing well. It's the successful, the talented. They're welcome in the family of God because God doesn't need their talent. God's not impressed with their good looks. God's not impressed with their intelligence or achievement. God welcomes everyone into His family. There's room for those people as well. The, the next person I'll look at is Solomon. Um, Solomon, it, it, this is sort of a, a fascinating thing. Actually, in the text here, it's a Solomon whose mother had been Uriah's wife. So this is really fascinating. I just mentioned King David. King David has this um, adulterous affair with this woman. He sees this woman. He wants this woman. He sleeps with this woman and gets her pregnant and goes, uh-oh, what am I going to do here? And so he has this plan. Okay, I'm going to take this woman's wife who's named Uriah. I'm going to bring him back from the battle he's fighting in, try to get them to sleep together. That way it looks like it's their kid. This is his grand strategy. The only problem is Uriah is a good dude. And Uriah comes back from battle and goes, I can't sleep with my wife while my, my brothers in arms are fighting out in the field. I'm not going to sleep with my wife. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay committed to this fight. And, and so Uriah doesn't sleep with his wife. And, and this makes David really, really, really angry. And, and so Uriah's wife is pregnant. Uriah doesn't know this. David sends Uriah out into battle and then tells everyone else to leave him hanging alone. And so Uriah charges into battle and everyone else stands there. And Uriah gets killed. He gets murdered. So you got David who's murdered Uriah, and then you got Uriah's wife who's pregnant, and Uriah's wife has a son, a baby boy, and this baby boy's name is Solomon. Like imagine how awkward family dinners must be. Like imagine this, like, hi, you're my biological dad, and you killed my biological mom's husband, um, and it's just kind of like this super broken, awkward family tree. And here's why I point this out. 
Because Jesus' family, according to this text, is filled with people whose family trees are broken and messed up and filled with pain. Jesus' family tree is filled with people whose family situations are messed up. There's all sorts of pain and brokenness there. And here's what's not lost, Sunday. The same is true with this room, right? Uh, like maybe a majority of you have parents who are divorced or grandparents who are divorced or you've seen extraordinary pain in your family, maybe the death of a family member, maybe something overwhelming or, or just horrible or just you can't even speak about it. It's been so bad in your family. Like some of you, this whole idea of being in the family of God is hard to get your mind around because your family that you grew up in is so messed up that you don't want anything to do with the family. And here's the good news of the gospel. God says that people like you are welcome into his family. There's room for people like you in Jesus' family. That Jesus' family is filled with people. And this church is filled with people whose family lives are messed up, who they're filled with brokenness and pain. Um, the next person we're going to look up here is Asa. Um, <clears throat> Asa is um, <clears throat> actually all throughout, the, um, all throughout the Psalms, you'll see his name pop up from time to time. Um, he was a songwriter. He was a worship leader. I said here, he loved to worship God. And, and so again, sometimes it can sound like we're talking about like all the people who are jacked up and messed up are welcome in the family of God. And that's true for people who are jacked up and messed up. But here's who else is welcomed into the family of God. People who truly love Jesus. People who just want to worship him. Uh, like, I know there's some of you, you walk into this place, and it's not like, oh, I have to go to church. It's like, I get to go to church today. It's Sunday, and I get to worship. I get to sing before the Lord. Uh, I know there's some of you that, that like, you'll come su Sunday and worship, and then you'll go to camp, and you'll worship, and, and then you'll be like, let's meet out by the lake, and we'll, we'll worship. And then some of you, I think, even recently had, like, a little worship night thing going where you got together and worshiped, and you're just like, let's do this over and over and over and over again. And there is a place in the family of God for the people who just say, my entire life, I just want to worship. That's all I want to do. That's all I want to be about. God's family is filled with people who are passionate about the praise and the worship and the glory of his name. So, so on the one hand, I do want to say that if you are the broken, the sinful, the people who have messed up real bad, you are welcomed in the family of God. But I also want to point to the people who say, I'm so passionate about worship. I'm so fired up for the praise and the glory of Jesus' name. There's room for everyone in the family of God. It, it continues on this way. We're going to look at a guy named uh, Manasseh. Uh, Manasseh is this... Um, this fascinating uh, person in the Bible. He's a king. Um, and in Israel's history, there were two types of kings. There were the kings who were good, who, who worshipped God, who, who trusted God, who, who had a nation that did moral good, right things. And then there were wicked kings. And, and some of the kings are good and some of the kings are wicked. And Manasseh is definitely one of the wicked kings. He's one of the bad ones. He's one of the evil ones. He has people murdered. He steals their land. He sacrifices children. He does horrible, horrible, wicked things. He hurts people deeply. He's one of the most hated kings in all of the Bible. He's one of these most hated individuals, and yet he shows up here in Jesus' genealogy, which tells me this, that there's room in the people of God for people who have hurt other people. Like, it's not lost to me that some of you actually come into this room and you've been hurt by someone. You've been abused. You've been stabbed in the back. You've been gossiped about. Like, there's stories all over this room of how you've been hurt. But here's what I also know. There's stories of this room, of people sitting in the chairs right now, where you've hurt people. Like some of you have gossiped about someone and it's hurt their heart. Some of you have stabbed someone in the back, betrayed them. Some of you have physically harmed other people. Your siblings, people at your school, people on your team. Some of you have stolen from people. We don't talk about that a lot, but some of you have actually stolen stuff from people. You've harmed people, you've hurt people, you've abused people, and maybe you've figured out a way to justify it, but you are someone who has harmed other people. And here is the stunning good news of the gospel, that both the people who are hurt and the people who harm are welcome into the family of God, that there's room for people like you. So, so maybe you're one of those people and you've actually hurt people and you're kind of living in this ongoing shame of like, if anyone ever really knew how much I hurt that girl, they would never want me here in church. And here's what I'm here to say, that we are going to call you to repentance, we are going to call you to purity, we are going to call you to righteousness, and you are always welcome in this church. Second to last person, um, I want to look at a guy named Azor. Um, Azor is, is, a, is an interesting person here in the Bible. Um, and the reason Azor is interesting um, is because we don't know anything about Azor other than his name. That's the only thing we know. 
And, and here's what I love about that. Um, sometimes what can happen is we can think the Bible is filled with all these people who are like superstar heroes and everyone loves them and everyone knows them and they're like these mighty giants of the faith. Here's the thing about Azor. Um, he made the book, but barely, right? Like he's like in there, but we don't know anything else about him. And, and I actually always love characters like that in the Bible who just their name makes it in there or just like two sentences about it makes it in there. Because I think so often of this, I think there are people in this room who feel like they're not the center of attention. They're never going to be up on stage. If I called them up right now, I'm like, here's a microphone, share something. You'd just like pee yourself and die. Like that's what would happen, right? And, and here's, here's what I know. Some of you, if I called you up, you'd be like, I've been waiting for this moment, right? But some of you would actually just collapse because you hate the idea of being in front of people. You hate the idea of being the center of attention. You hate the idea of being the person who walks in and everyone crowds around them. You have like a few good friends that you hold really tight, but you hate the idea of being this super social butterfly person. And here's the great thing about the gospel. Here's the great thing about the people of God. There's room for you in the family. Like our family of God is not meant to be a bunch of extroverts who love being in front of people. The family of God welcomes people who are quiet, who aren't the center of attention. In fact, if you actually want to know in the Bible, there's kind of this tendency, it doesn't always work out this way, the people who are like big and loud and bold and in front of everyone and like I'm really awesome tend to be the people who are the most wicked at times. And then the people in the Bible who are quiet, who serve behind the scenes and who are faithful actually tend to be some of the unsung heroes of the Bible. And I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced in our high school ministry we have unsung heroes who faithfully attend and faithfully serve and they pray for others and they worship God and they study the Bible and they encourage their friends and they do everything that we've called them to do. And maybe you're not the most popular person here. Maybe you're not the one everyone in the room knows. Maybe you'll never end up on the stage or in a video or, or in some kind of spotlight. And I just want to say to you that God uses people like you mightily and there's room in God's family for you. And then the 10th person, the final person we're going to look at tonight is Mary. Um, Mary, uh, here's what I said about Mary, that she's trying to be faithful in her time and season. Um, maybe you've never really thought about the Mary story really deeply, um, but that's what I'm going to ask you to do, um, especially today, and especially uh, for you ladies to think about this. Um, maybe growing up you always saw Mary as older than you, but here's the crazy thing. Most estimates are Mary's a teenager when all this happens. Mary's your age, okay? So ladies, I want you to imagine you go to bed tonight, you dive into the covers, you fall asleep, you wake up middle of the night, there's an angel there. Okay, first off, what? Second off, angel says to you, I've got a few things to let you know. First thing is, um, you're going to be pregnant. And you're like, ah. Uh, and and she, no, the angel's like, no, like that's, that's how it's going to go down. You're like, but I've, I've not, I know how this works. I took health class, like I'm not happening. And, and the angel goes, no, no, not, not a problem. This is part number two. Um, it's going to be of God. Like God's going to bring the baby about. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, and then part three is uh, it's the, he's the savior of the world. So don't mess this up. <laughs> like that's like, Im imagine this for a moment. Okay, and, and so then think about this. Maybe you've never really thought through. Um, Mary gets this information, learns she's pregnant. Um, and then maybe you've never thought of the unbelievable moment that she had to sit and tell Joseph about this. Hey, Joseph, uh, got some news for you. Don't, don't freak out. I don't want you to freak out, right? Um, I'm pregnant. No, no, okay, but no, God made me pregnant, and I'm bringing God's son, Jesus, the savior of the world, into the world. This is a painful moment. Like, I don't want you to clean up the Christmas story. I don't want you to turn the Christmas story into, like, Joseph hears this and goes, hmm, okay, I guess I'll believe. Like, I got to imagine, like, Joseph eventually comes around, but I got to imagine there's just pain and angst. In Mary's heart, there's this amazing moment where she responds with joy, but I also got to imagine there's doubt and wonder and curiosity inside of her soul. And here's the reason I share all of this. Because of all the people I just named, all the different types of people in God's family, I'm actually convinced that most of you resonate with Mary. And here's what I mean by that. I don't mean that, like, God got you pregnant, especially you young men. Like, that. no. Um, but but hear, hear me. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. I, I'm convinced that for a lot of you, like, your life isn't this, like, massive crazy thing where you're, like, the king of some nation or doing some wild crazy thing. For most of us, the call of God on our life is just be faithful with the time and the resources God's given us. And I think that's what a lot of you are doing. You're just trying to be faithful to God in high school. 
You're just trying to be a person who walks with Jesus and figures out what it means to be a teenager living in 2017 and walking with Jesus. That's what you're trying to figure out. In your time and in your season of life, in this space that you live in now, you're just trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus and be faithful to him. And the crazy thing about our God is that he uses a young teenager named Mary who's just trying to figure out how to be faithful to bring salvation into the world. And the crazy thing is God's still doing that through teenagers. Like God is still using teenagers who would be faithful to him to bring salvation into this world, to bring salvation to your friends and to your family, to bring goodness and love into a world filled with darkness and hate. And here's the crazy thing. There's room in the family of God for you. If you don't feel like you're super spectacular, if you don't feel like you're changing the whole world, sometimes the, the rallying call is like, change the whole world. What if it was just be faithful with what God's asked you to do? Be faithful in this season. And when you go off to college, be faithful in that season. And someday when you get married, be faithful in that season. And someday when you have a kid, be faithful to God in that season. And in every season of your life, be faithful to who God is in your time and in your season because that's where God does his best work. That's where God does his greatest miracles. See, I read through this, this genealogy of 42 names, and I look maybe at these 10 names we looked at tonight. And maybe some of the stories you know super well, and some of them are kind of like, oh, I've never heard that story. I want to go check that out in the Bible. And so you'll go read it and check it out. But here's what I think you'll find as you dig through these 42 names. Um, Jesus' family is all over the place. Jesus' family is completely all over the place. Like maybe you've fallen into the idea that everyone in the Bible is sort of like this very solemn looking person that has a halo floating like two inches above their head and they're just kind of like humming worship songs everywhere they go. But that's not actually what the Bible describes. Jesus' family is full of messy, completely different people, but they're all brought together by Jesus. They're all part of the family of God. Because that's how it works, right? That's not just how it works in the Bible, it's how it works in your family. Uh, like many of you don't know this, um, uh, I, I come from a family, or uh, my original family of origin ha has me and, and five others. So there's my mom, there's my dad, and I have three brothers. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. She raised um, four sons, uh, stayed at home most of her life, um, raised us, was amazing. I, at one point had three really little kids running around. It was insane, uh, but she was a stay-at-home mom. My dad has been a banker for 35 years. My older brother is a doctor. He lives in Las Vegas. Uh, I'm number two in the family, um, and I'm a pastor, and I live here. Um, number three in the family is a computer programmer. He lives in Seattle. His name is Stephen. And number four in the family, most of you know, um, the guy, he rolls up here, reads scripture occasionally, looks a lot like me. Uh, that's Ben. He goes to Pepperdine. We don't know what will become of his life. Um, so the six of us, and here's why I point this out, six of us. Living in Seattle, Northern California, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas. In completely different professions, doing completely different things, with completely different personalities. And yet, here's what binds us together. What binds us together is that we're family. And what binds us together is the fact that we share a bloodline. Like, even if I decided I'm never going to talk to any of my brothers again, they don't stop being my brothers because we share a bloodline. Like, we share that blood. That bloodline, the Howard bloodline, bonds us together forever. And here's the point of the Christmas story. I don't want you to miss this this Christmas. The point of the Christmas story is that Jesus steps into human history to pull together people who are radically, completely different. People like this list and people like everyone in this room. He steps into human history to form a new family with a new bloodline. A bloodline not of the blood that runs through your veins, but rather the bloodline of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for you and for me. That's the bloodline that Jesus created. That Jesus bled and died to create a new family. He bled and died so that all of the people on this list and all of the people in this room could be part of the family of God. That's what Christmas is all about, that he made us family. He made us family not in like a cute kind of like, we're family, we all love each other. Sometimes we say that, like, it's like we're a little family. What he actually did was shed blood so that we could legitimately be family. Not just sort of how we feel, like I feel like we're all family. The fact that 100 million years from now, like think about this, 100 million years from now, you've died. If you trusted in the Lord, you're in heaven with God. There will be only one family that matters, and it's not the one you grew up in. It's the one that Jesus put you in when he purchased you with his precious blood. That's the family you'll be a part of forever. And if you look around this room right now, 
these are your brothers. These are your sisters. Uh, Like, I want you to hear this really clearly. If you call yourself a Christian in a very serious way, not in a hokey, cheesy way, I am your brother in Christ. Ladies, you are my sisters in Christ. Gentlemen, you are my brothers in Christ. Not in this sort of like I feel close to you. In the way that actually Jesus has created a family. He's our big brother. God's our father. And we're stuck with each other for all of eternity. He made his family. That's what he did. The Christmas story is about Jesus stepping into this world to make a new family. So that all of the jacked up, messed up stuff we had in our family growing up, eventually we will leave that behind and be part of this family of God forevermore. If you came from an amazing, awesome family of parents who loved you, that's incredible because it points to what the family of God should be. The Christmas story is about the fact that Jesus made us family. And so here's how we're going to close tonight. We are going to worship this Jesus, and we're just going to lift his name up one more time in 2017. Um, Our our band's going to make their way up right now, and um, as they do, I I, I want us to consider this. Um, I I want us to consider... um, uh, uh, just us being family, us, us kind of being the family of God. Uh, I want to show you just one picture, and, and I love th- these types of pictures. We take them um, twice a year. I'm going to put it up right here, um, this picture right here. Um, raise your hand if you were in this picture. Okay, awesome. Uh, if you don't know where this picture is taken, shh. Um, this picture is uh, from Hume Lake last year. Um, And this is our group picture that we took at the very end of the weekend. Um, I love these group pictures because of the thing we struggle with here at HSM. You're all very lost looking for yourselves. Um, This is really, like, I'm enjoying watching you. But the reason we take these group pictures and that we love them so much is because we have these 11 a.m., 5 p.m. services. And and so we're really rarely all together. And and then there comes these moments like camp where, where most of us get together and most of us are here. And you look at this picture and you see this picture and you see these people, these wild and crazy and amazing people. And you look at this and you go, that's our family photo. And again, some of you didn't make it last year. You'll be there this year. There's a whole bunch of reasons that you might not be in that photo, but hear me on this. That's our family picture as much as your family picture you took for your Christmas card is. Because this is our family. This is who we are. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus is our big brother and God the Father is our dad. That's what the Christian faith is all about and that's what the Christmas story teaches us. That Jesus comes into this world and he comes from a genealogy. He comes from a bloodline that's filled with brokenness and pain and he steps into this world to say, I'm going to make a new family so that all of the old things of brokenness and pain can go away. And that's a beautiful thing. That's something worth celebrating this Christmas season. I just want to speak over anyone in this room who family's a tough thing and it's gnarly and going home tonight's not going to be fun and, and going to grandma's house over Christmas is just not a good experience. I want to say that you are welcomed into this family and that this is the family that's going to love you forever. And, and then I want to say to anyone in this room who has an awesome family, mom and dad love you. You've got a great relationship with your siblings. I want to say to you that that is meant to point toward a greater reality and that greater reality is the family of Jesus. And I turn, and I look at this picture, and I think to myself, this is an incredible family. It's the family that Jesus shed his blood that we might be a part of. And then I guess the final invitation as we close out 2017 is this. There's always room for one more. There's always room for one more. Maybe that person who's kind of been like kind of on the edges of high school ministry and you've been checking it out and kind of showing up from time to time. But you know what's the cool thing? Like there's always room for one more in this family. There's always room for you. Maybe you're the person who for whatever reason just kind of feels like you've you've had to back away from HSM for whatever reason or back away from church. And I just want to tell you there's always room for you to come home, to come back to the family. And that's the invitation for you as we get into 2018. It's the invitation that you would jump in, that you would participate, that you wouldn't just show up occasionally, but that you would join. Maybe it's as practical as you are in the next picture because you go to winter camp. Maybe it's as practical as you join a small group to make sure you don't just show up in a large group to worship, but you show up in a small group so that you're known and that you're loved. I I want to invite some of you as we get into 2018 that you would say yes and that you would join the family that you would say yes to the invitation of Jesus, the invitation of Christmas, that he would make a new family out of you and me for all of eternity. Let's pray, uh, and then we're going to come before this Jesus and sing. Um, Lord, 
I praise you that we're family. I praise you that you're our big brother, Jesus. You're the one we look to. You're the one who protects us and guides us. Father, I thank you that you're the God over us, that you're the dad over us, that you've welcomed us into your family, not by anything we've done, but by your grace and by your mercy. I pray for any young woman, young man in this room who's struggling to believe that they're welcome in your family, struggling to believe that they have a place in your courts, in your household. God, I pray that your grace and mercy would be upon them tonight. God, as we lift up the name of Jesus right now, as we adore him, as we give him glory, as we proclaim him as worthy, I pray that you would fill our hearts with the kind of faith, the kind of faith it takes to believe, God, that you made us family. And so we pray this in the resurrected, strong name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said?